Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Iconic Band Lineups. It's Friday morning, so of course, in the co-captain's chair, uh, I'm pointing the wrong direction. There he is, Mr. Martin Popoff. Good morning, my friend. How are you this morning? Good yes, to see you. Good morning. Yep, definitely doing doing fine. This is this is really intriguing doing a show like this. This is my uh, my first one of these, uh, so so thanks for having me along. Yeah, good to have you. So yeah, there have been a, a ton of people who have asked for Martin and I to do a Deep Purple show together. And my guess is this will probably be the first of a few because I, he and I have talked a lot about this band. And I think there's a lot of directions we, we can go. But to kind of celebrate the newness of this theme show, uh, Martin and I were talking about it. And we thought it would be kind of interesting if we both picked a different lineup. So we've got Mark how many marks we got? Seven, something like that. I think it's seven. Seven, seven yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, eight. Yeah, eight, eight in total. With eight in total. Stuff. So yeah. we each decided to pick a different mark and for different reasons. And I think it'll make for some cool conversation. So I decided to go with Mark two and Martin decided to go with Mark eight, right? Let, let's eight. call it eight. Yeah, yeah, let's call it eight. So, and there's reasons why we each picked those okay so i think um martin and i'll let martin talk more about it but i chose mark two because to me that is when people think of deep purple that is the kind of like the picture of this band right gillen glover blackmore pace and lord however when martin and i were talking martin's like well you know but that lineup was together for a very short period of time three separate times they kind of start and stop and all that kind of stuff yet the, the lineup that martin is going to talk about has been together the longest of any of them. And for a lot of people who still follow the band, I mean, that's, that's Deep Purple now. It has been for a long time. So uh, I'm going to let Martin start us off with uh, his kind of discussion, and we'll both chime in on each other's, about Mark 8. So, the, so we're talking about Morse, Airy, Gillen, Glover, and Pace. So I'll let Martin start it off here. Yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, I, Mark 7 bleeds into Mark 8 because, unfortunately, we lose John Lord, right? He, he dies, but he is actually on the first two of, uh, of what, you know, really in spirit is one Mark when Steve Morse joins the band. You know, they, they change quite a bit, um, and they do probably, yeah, you, you could call it two of the best ones of this whole era with Perpendicular and Abandoned, but for argument's sake, let's uh, let's call it just Mark Eight with Don Airy in there. So it's Don Airy, Steve Morse, Ian Gillen, Roger Glover. Uh, who did I leave out? Ian Pace, right? Yep. Um, so uh, so essentially, I I feel pretty confident, um, you know, calling it this way because um, I we did an episode of our show, The Contrarians, a while back, and I actually picked Perfect Strangers as my favorite Deep Purple album, and a lot of the argument there was that. Um, when, 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 like in the cold, harsh light of day, when I look at all those classic Deep Purple albums, I find quite a few songs that eh, I'm not that crazy about. They don't have a lot of songs in the album. But when you get to Mark 8, you get a sort of similar thing that happens to me with Perfect Strangers, which is I like the whole thing. Um, and so with Mark 8, that happens with, with all of these records. So yes, this is, this is a long-standing lineup. That's one cool thing about it. And what I really like is this idea of um, the guys growing up and maturing and having a guitarist in there who comes from more of a, um, a cerebral background with Dixie Dregs and, and Kansas and comes from a, you know, middle America and the American South sort of feel like he brings a whole different culture to the band. But what happens is, um, and, and, he, and he brings, you know, all the stuff in his toolbox, which are, which are very different tools from Richie. And then it, it just seems like, uh, you know, a Pandora's box of writing is opened up for these guys. And the writing just gets really interesting and mature. Like the mellow songs are not rote mellow songs. They're complicated and proggy. The heavy songs... Um, you know, there's a big debate going on right now with Woosh. I just did a, a banger overkill review uh, on Woosh, and there's a lot in the comments about a lot of people not liking the album very much. And and it almost seems like it's it's a few of the negatives that I brought up in that um, in that there's there's sort of a uniformness across everything, and that that is a that is a characteristic of this band as well. But it's a uniformness to me that is at a super high level. And, and again, you know, all of these albums, the Mark 8, it starts with, uh, with Bananas. Uh, where's, my, where's my little Bananas thing here? Here we got our uh, Bananas, my little framed deal there with a Bananas ad from, from, uh, 
uh, burn, and then I like a that. fully signed bananas there and a pass. Um, but it starts with bananas and moves up through Rapture of the Deep, Now What, Infinite, and Whoosh. And that's a great pile of, of records. And, you know, we can have a big debate about the heaviness of, of this lineup because in certain ways it's even heavier than the old lineups because it's uniformly quite loud and quite heavy throughout. But it is missing that, um, that sort of, uh, that Stratocaster bite and the straight riffiness that you get with the Ritchie. But I, I just find that there's a fulsomeness, a fullness of the sound. And, uh, and they've really, I, I almost feel like this lineup is where they've really um, uh, taken to heart the idea of the grinding Hammond, you know, through a Leslie, blah, 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 sort of sound where, where um, there's even, you know, they, they, they managed this with Machine Head, but I, I, I don't think they really managed it quite so well as they do in the Mark Eight era with Don Airy and, and Mark Seven with John Lord, where, where you get this really super heaviness of, of the chordiness songs, the chordy heavy songs. You get more chordy songs than you get more intricate note dance riffy songs, I think, with the modern Deep Purple. But you do get a real, uh, like um, that, that keyboard's really being that second or third or fourth layer of rhythm guitar uh, in, in what you get. So, so yeah, there, there's, I, I guess to sum up, a maturity, a feeling that the guys are writing for, I love you know that they talk about this all the time, but they're writing for the age they're at, which is an experienced age. You know, we, we've talked many times, Pete, about the whole idea that, that shouldn't you get better at this as, as you go on, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't your newer stuff be better? Like it's a, it's a big debate, right? But are you not as hungry, as ambitious, as you think you know it all, so you're bolder with your decisions, right? So the, a lot of people are saying, yeah, there, there's not a boldness there. But to my mind, there's massive creativity and boldness and, and, and progginess and, and all sorts of stuff that you don't expect um, that is in this lineup that, that people don't give it enough credit for. So, so yeah, there you go. That's, that's uh, I, I, I probably will, you know, for the rest of my life, however long that is, we'll probably only be playing these records um, because there's just so much to dig into and find across them. And they've, and they've you know, one, they're one of the greatest examples of a band making lots and lots of new music all the time. And I think it's of a super high quality. So there you go. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a consistency across all these albums from Perpendicular to Whoosh. And they maybe didn't have that in the past. Like, you know, like if you go back and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but if, you know, you look at Mark, two, Mark one and Mark two, which sound completely different. Mark three sounds completely different to what came before it. You know, then you throw the Joe Lynn Turner kind of, you know, thing in there. And then it's just, so you have all this inconsistencies, a lot of great music, but yet there's this sophistication and classiness of every album from perpendicular on that, for me anyway, I totally agree with it. It's like, yeah, these albums are different from the old stuff. It's like, there is, there's not this element of brashness. There's not this element of danger. I talk all the time about Blackmore brought an element of danger and you never knew what was going to come from his fingers or out of his mouth or anything. You never knew that, right? Steve Morse is not really that guy. And I think there's people, the people who kind of resent Steve Morse or don't accept him in the band, they miss that element of danger from Blackmore. And I get it. But that was like so 1970s, so not, so the 80s, right? Steve is like, and we both talked to Steve. He's a very kind of meticulous, down to earth guy. He, you know, he's a phenomenal player. Uh, but let's also, you know, let's talk about how production techniques and you know working with Bob Ezrin and working with Martin Birch is a completely different thing. Uh, I'm sure Martin Birch let Richie do a lot of what he wanted to do, whereas Steve Morse has gone on record saying that, you know what, Bob Ezrin kind of reins me in a little bit. So these newer albums are not all about the, the humongous riffing and a lot of notes like you mentioned and all that sort of thing. Whereas I think, you know, back in the 70s, bands were allowed to kind of go for it a little more. Whereas this band is creating songs. They're creating artful songs. And there's a lot more prog rock going on. And it's like, there's a lot less of that 70s heavy rock and metal going on, but these guys are in their 70s. I mean, that's just, for me, I find these well-constructed, artful albums that they put on to be quite refreshing. 
And again, you're looking at a long catalog here with a lot of variety throughout it. And it always frustrates me that people want to compare these albums to Machine Head and Rock, Fireball and Burn, because it's just, it's completely different eras, completely different bands. Uh, and it's just, I, I wish at some point people would just accept these albums and enjoy them for what they are, because they're really, really good. And it's like, you know what? I love Richie to death. I love him. He's my favorite guitar player of all time, but he's been gone for 30 years already. It's like, you know, it's time to move on. Uh, but, and I think the, the longevity of this lineup speaks volumes. And for me as a fan, since I was a little kid, I love seeing the band happy in their current skin, loving making music, loving playing live and loving each other. I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, I don't know if you read yesterday, um, I forget where I, where did I read? I don't even remember where I read. I read a long article where they interviewed all the members like last week talking about the state of the band and going forward. And basically what you got from all of them is that they're not counting out making another album after this. Mm. They're not ready to retire. They're, yeah. they're not. It's like they said COVID proved to them that they still have the hunger in them to go out and play live and make new music. So you know, the long road, end of the road tour that they talked about in 2017, it's not happening anytime soon, guys. So just uh, for all of you who, who don't want Deep Purple to go away, they're not going yeah. away. So uh, so back to my, um, so Mark II, all right? So for me, when I think iconic, I think, when it comes to this band, I think Gillen, Glover, Pace, Blackmore, and Lord. I mean, those are the guys who made this band the super band that they were. Um we're talking early seventies. And again, I know they, they reformed back in the eighties and then, you know, they did perfect strangers and house of blue light. Perfect strangers is a great album. House of blue light spotty, still good. Uh, then Gillen's out, uh, you know, Joel and Turner's in that album to me is the worst purple album ever. Uh, then they battle rages on decent album, but you could tell they, they're just not liking each other. Those two guys. Right. So that was never meant to be. Um, and by that time, Blackmore is interested in doing other things, but I think like that classic. So we're talking about in rock fireball machine head made in Japan. Who do we think we are contains their best songs, you know, where their most well-known songs, um, arguably best is, you know, for the individual listener. Um, that's the lineup that made these guys huge. And I think that, you have to go back to the time where rock stars were allowed to be rock stars and they were. So you had, you know, Blackmore, man in black, larger than life, immense player, probably one of the most unique players of all time. And Ian Gillen guy with the long ass hair, right. And the shrieking vocals, him and Blackmore playing. I mean, that's like one of the best guitarist vocalist duos of all time, in my opinion. And what's interesting is that they made it so, enchanting to watch probably because behind the scenes they just didn't really care for each other much and that kind of like a little bit of animosity came out on stage and it, it just brought this element of tension and i'll use that word danger again because i just think it works so well with this band and they made that work as long as they possibly could and then you had ian pace who i don't know about you martin but probably one of the best drummers of all time who just doesn't get the credit he deserves he has been rock solid in this band from day one and he's just he's always fantastic john lord i mean we miss him terribly one of the originators of the heart hammond organ in hard rock mixing classical and heart heavy rock the guy was just an absolute genius and and you know roger glover you know you could argue you know you could say what you want about whether he's the best bass player that was ever in this band or not don't know but he's rock solid he's a good producer good songwriter arranger and i just think these guys together just made magic and mark three was magical too but to a lot of people mark three was not quite the same and didn't last as long and maybe not as many you know popular songs, iconic songs, I don't know, whatever. I just think that most people, when they think of this band, they think of those, that group of guys. And together they made magic. But this, you know, this band has plenty of other magical moments. And I think that's, that's we're speaking more of the testament to this band in general, right? As opposed, you know, we're, we're picking out a couple lineups here, but the case can be made for Mark Three. Some people really feel great about Mark One. Right. Some people love the Tommy Bolin, you know, Mark four with Tommy Bolin. I think that 
every, for me anyway, with the exception of the Joel and Turner era, which is a fine album for what it is, but I think it's the weakest Deep Purple album. I think that was more like a rainbow album, should have stayed that way. Um, I think all these other lineups are just absolutely fantastic and have brought so much to the table for this band that all of us fans could, will cherish long, long after this band is gone and generations after we're all gone, we'll, we'll cherish this stuff. But, uh, but your, your mark, been around a long time, great music. Yeah. You have to wonder too, did you ever think about like if, let's kind of switch times a little bit here, if Perpendicular through Whoosh were, re were released in like the late 70s through the mid 80s, wonder how they would be thought about today. Yeah, I, I, think, I think they would have been fine because I think the songwriting is so solid. You know, I mean, it's, it's like I say, I, I, think, I think I could play those for a long, long time and never really get bored because there's so much going on. But I, I did want to mention, though, you know, it, it's funny. I think, I think Burn is really coming up in people's estimation as one of the great, great Deep Purple albums. Not so much Stormbringer, but I hear Burn all the time now, right? So I hear Burn, I hear Machine Head in rock. Like I say, I like I like Perfect Strangers because I like you know almost everything on it. Um, I, I think it's really good uh, in terms of um, you know just uh, just being a super professional album where they're trying really really hard. Like I think it was a good reunion. I, I'm not I'm not that big a hater of the Joel and Turner one. I mean to me that that lineup is you know people called it Deep Rainbow and I, I think it was doomed from the start because yeah. it is so much rainbow. It's basically Joe and Richie, and then Roger, of course, Roger. part of Rainbow as well. So, and, and those are the, the three chief songwriters uh, of the band. So basically, uh, you know, Ian and John are, are in the background already. Ian and John, you know, they were both in Whitesnake, right? Um, yeah. Together. So it, it's, it's funny. So I don't mind that album. And I, I, I think the production's really good on it. It's, it's, it's got very good analogness to it. To, to my mind, my least favorite lineup is definitely the, the first one, the Rod Evans, Nick Simper lineup. I just, that stuff is so old sounding to me that, uh, you know, even, even in rock is a, I get a lot of heck for this, but I even, I even find in rock a little, little old for me uh, in terms of like, it's so, it's so harsh and mid rangey, but um, I love it. I love it for that. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely well, adore it in rock. What what I love it for more than anything is that I I often say okay the the three the the four albums that that invented heavy metal proper are are your I very heavy very humble in rock Black Sabbath and Paranoid all in 1970 in rock's right in the middle and in rock is actually the heaviest I think of all of those maybe Paranoid is is coming up close but. You know, had in rock been six months earlier or five months earlier, we would have been saying Deep Purple invented heavy metal rather than Black Sabbath, yeah. um, because I think I think it's kind of light years or 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 let's say twenty four months or, or three years ahead of uh, of both the Black Sabbath albums in terms of modernity, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, classic lineup. Um, you know, something you mentioned that the tension. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people. I I, do, I personally don't ascribe to this, but a lot of people say that when there is tension in a band between the creators, um, it will make the band better. And and you know, the logical side of saying that is that um, you're you're both competing for each other for for who's the most creative person in this band. So maybe you're both trying way harder because yeah. you're trying to. <clears throat> You know, upstage your own band needs, right? So, well, yeah, but you know, you can say, uh, yeah, and you could say that tension within a, in a band when you're in your early twenties is different than tension in a band when you're in your forties and above. Because as yeah. we saw, the tension in the band during Battle Rage is on did not work at all. Yeah, yeah, it's a different and, thing when you're, you know, yeah, twenty something and you're touring the world for the first time, and it's yeah. like, yeah, all right. The interesting thing with that album is that um, I, I'm I'm probably not going to get the sequence right. It was in my old deep my deep purple books are both now out of print. Actually, the, these are not. I still have these two. These are the timeline with quotes ones, right? That are out through Weimer now, and they're full of like four or five hundred pictures each, like all the ads and all that stuff. But but the but the um, the old one, you know, I, I had a lot of stuff in there from the producer and Joe, and it's either. Um, is it Jim Pederick? Possibly not Jim Pederick. No, I mean, I think he's in on the songwriting, but they had another lead singer plus Joe. And essentially the bottom line is when Ian came back into the band, he had to basically sing over complete finished music and just come up with new lyrics and shove them into place. Yep. So that's, that causes 
you know, possibly, um, you know, some of that stiffness uh, to the feel of it. And, and the lyrics aren't the greatest on that album. Uh, you know, one more thing I want to say about the Richie lineup that kind of, um, you know, knocks it down a slight peg for me is, is that you were expecting this, um, you know, God love him for inventing along with Jimmy Page, but more so Richie, that, that Egypto, Moroccan, Turkish, Middle Eastern, whatever you want to call it, tones. But it almost seemed a little bit at times like it's like, okay, got to put two of those on, got to write, write one right now, stick it on, right? So, so every one of those records and the Rainbow Records and everything. Oh, especially the Rainbow Records. Yeah, yeah it's oh, yeah. like he's, he's got to stick on two or three of those because it's expected. And maybe, maybe, it's, uh, maybe sometimes the songwriting of those kinds might feel a little bit forced. So you, you get, you know... Battle Rage is on is a masterpiece of a song, but it's definitely one of those. But then you've got Anya on there as well, you know, and uh, and and you know, even in the modern era and the old era, there there are, there do seem to be kind of boxes that the band ticks off. Like like these are the five styles we kind of write in. But I just I just feel like the rule breaking is a is a little is a little different now, and it's 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 of a mature type, like you say. Um, you know, there's more danger, I suppose, in the early stuff. But, uh, but yeah, um, just to reiterate, I, I'd say I'd say the main reason I, I could argue with this one with my heart and fully believe it is when I go back to all those old albums, I do find two or three songs that I'm just really not a fan of at all, and that doesn't really happen on these. I'm I'm more rooting for the creativity of the band across every song. Like even when there is a song that I don't like. I'm feeling it's coming from a really creative space. So I'm, I'm rooting for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I get you. And you know, one thing we didn't bring up too, that I know you'll appreciate uh, a big difference between these two lineups is that Mark two at their core, were kind of like a jam band. So, you know, you look at like live performances from deep purple back in 72 or 73, or even, you know, the Mark three era. And you look at this lineup. I mean, these guys now they come out, they play their dozen songs, you kind of know what you're going to expect. It's, you know, if you want to just come hear the songs, that's what you get. And that's what a lot of people like nowadays, because let's, let's be real here. Audiences in 2020, well, let's forget 2020 because nobody's watching anything this year, but you know, 2019 or going forward, uh, really aren't interested in seeing 20 minute long solos and, and 25 minute long songs. Whereas back in the day, that was Deep Purple set list, right? They play for two hours, three hours, and they play like eight songs. Right. So you'd have, you know, space truck and half hour long and mistreated and, you know, I, I hate that. Right. I, I, that's the reason why I brought it up, because I know you're not into all that jazz. I hate right? made Japan so much and I hate <laughs> small remains the same. And I hate rainbow on stage. My God, I don't think there's a worse one. Worse than that, than rainbow <laughs> on stage, right? I just and I, I yeah, I get, I get a lot of crap for that because, you know, many people will just put up their hand and say made in Japan is the greatest live album of all time. And, and I just, I'm just bored to tears by it. Right. I, I, I'm the guy that wants to hear four songs on every side of a live album. You know, give me that. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get you and Chris Allo on the same show together. Cause Chris Allo has the exact same opinions as you to, to for you guys to talk about why you don't like those seventies long sprawling jammy yeah. filled live albums. I think that would be absolute comic gold. Yeah. Um, and, but I totally get that, but there's a lot of people who feel that way. And, uh, but that's, you know, another thing there, there are probably like a lot of old school folks who just, that, that's what they like. They want to hear the, all that improvisation and what have you. And let's, and, and that's a big uh, criticism that Steve Morse has gotten is that he doesn't do any of that stuff. I mean, he's not like Richie, you know, Steve stays to the solos. Everything is perfect for the song. I guess if you want to hear Steve Morse going, you know, bananas, you got to go see the Steve Morse band or, or the dregs. But even there, it's all very well constructed compositions Whereas Blackmore, I mean, let's face it, Blackmore never plays the solo the same twice. He plays, I, I was listening to, you know, in pre preparation for my uh, top guitar solos for Richie Blackmore's show. I mean, you could listen to any of those Deep Purple live albums in, from the 70s to try to pick like which is your favorite mistreated uh, solo. And like every single one of them is completely different because mm. Richie is just like of the mindset. It's like, well, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna play the, this Highway Star solo different every night. I'm gonna play the Smoke on the Water solo different every night, even though the record version is so iconic, he doesn't care. He's like, you know what? Eh, that's boring to play the same solo the same every night. I don't want to play it the way I played on the album. I'm going to throw something different there. So, and Morse does not that he's not of that school of thought. But Steve, I've been following Steve Morse for a long time, and he is very meticulous about uh, you know having things have a very similar construction and 
that's the way he plays live too. So, hmm. so yeah, it's a two totally different bands, two totally different bands. Yeah. And that, you know, I just, um, there's just so many people who just, they, they love what they love from when they were young and that's the way they remember things. And it's like, well, why can't the band today be like 1972? Well, it's, one more ago, quick right? point I want to point out is is I love the lyrics now too. I mean the lyrics oh, are yeah, some yeah, of the yeah. best hard yep. rock, classic rock lyrics you could possibly imagine. And and in the old days they were much more tossed off, right? Um, and and you know it's credit to both uh, both Ian and Roger. I mean Roger's obviously more than the bass player. He's a he's a big producer hat as well, right? Um, but he's also a big lyricist. And every time I interview these guys for a new album, it's like you know. Ian, Ian will say, I wrote all lyrics this time. Roger wrote all lyrics last time. We, we split them 50-50 before. So they're a real team. And, they, and they'll hand off and one guy will do more on one album and one guy will do less. But uh, super mature, really cool, thoughtful lyrics. You know, they tell stories. Of, they tell, yeah, they're, they're yeah. very true to life stuff. Yeah, I, um, I, I remember like reading an interview with uh, Ian a um, number of years ago and, and he was talking about how what hard time he had writing lyrics for Black Sabbath for the Born Again album because, you know, to be in Black Sabbath, you have to write lyrics of a certain kind of nature, right? And that's totally not him. He's, he wants to tell stories. I mean, you look at like the song Trashed. I mean, that there's a story behind that, right? That's not usually what you expect from Black Sabbath. So he had a really hard time yeah. writing lyrics for that album and then trying to sing the the geezer lyrics from the old stuff was even tougher or to try and sing Ronnie's stuff, which is like, you know, all about rainbows and dragons and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, that's, I, I think they don't get enough credit. Those two guys for really coming up with some playful, quirky and very honest and, you know, stories is what basically what they're doing. They're writing little mini stories. Yeah. And they, and they like wordplay too. I mean, I always have this image because they've, they've said it in interviews about sitting around doing crossword puzzles and stuff. They really like wordplay and Ian, Ian likes to, you know, I, I like to call it with Ian is uh, uh, Ian's English as a second language lyrics, right? He, he says a lot of really, really odd things that make you scratch your head and say, well, that sounds stupid. It's kind of funny kind of weird it makes you think i guess move on right yeah. and, and, he, and he just leaves it there right so so that that's kind of cool with him as well but uh yeah i, I mean whoosh has whoosh has killer lyrics it's, it's really cool and it goes with this this great progginess and matureness of the band yep absolutely so there you have it everybody iconic band lineups you got two for one today mark two and mark eight of deep purple i think this was uh more of just a great discussion of a great band, which, uh, I, you know, my favorite band of all time. So I'm, I'm happy that Martin came on the show to do this with us today. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Martin, you got a new book that just came in that you've got to plug, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, this is crazy. I'm dealing with a lot of PayPal's for, uh, for this. Limelight, Rush in the 80s. Goes with this one. Anthem, Rush in the 70s, and you get your nice, nice spines lining up, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's not at the website yet, but people can check out the Facebook or or email me at martinp at inforamp.net and I'll give you the information or whatever. But yeah, that's that's my next two weeks is signing these and packing them up and sending them out. It's, it's in like three weeks early kind of thing, which is kind of cool. Cool. Can you do me a favor and set one aside for me? I need to place some order with you. Cool. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I saw your Facebook post yesterday. I'm like, ah, oh, damn, gotta, gotta get that together. <laughs> All right, everybody. So thanks for joining. We'll have more of these iconic band lineups uh, coming up in the uh, weeks to come. So stay tuned and uh, have a good weekend, everybody, if I don't see you. And uh, Martin, See you soon. In fact, I'll see you Monday. So, all right. Yes. So, that's just talk about. So, Martin and I are doing a very cool show. So, everybody is loving the kind of uh, terrible album cover art for great albums that I've been doing with uh, Chris Allo and Ryan Scow and uh, Nicholas Franco. So, Martin and I have been talking. We wanted to do something as well here. So, what we've decided to do is we're each picking three bands who historically just had great albums with really bad album covers and, you know, just really bad album covers throughout their discography. And then we, in addition to those three, we each picked one that has a lot of albums, half great album covers, half just absolutely awful album covers. So that's coming up on Monday morning. So you don't want to miss that. That'll be a, a really fun discussion. And we'll be able to show off some really ridiculous album covers. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. I am Pete Pardo for Martin Popoff. Have a great uh, weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.